that I have to sleep on the couch when she has to write papers. Thank you. I love that so much. I love that so much. <laughs> so, but a part of what we're going to do today is that he's going to come, and then we're going to have what I think is going to be a very important conversation. Uh, Ray is Ray Robson is going to record it. We're going to probably put it on our we're going to put it on our Facebook pages. I think to have very you know two distinguished scholars just have a, a casual yet intense conversation. And of course, uh, I'm Dr. Poochier, who knows how to manage two very strong wounded men is going to lead us in a lot of great interest. So I think we're going to be okay. I think we're going to be okay. Then after that, we'll just kind of you know talk through any concerns you may have with students and how we can help. But one of the other things that I'm committed to doing is resetting the culture of respect because I am always grieved when students respond to even staff or faculty or even me in a manner that is not respectful. Please get this, and Dr. Jensen and Dr. Gulchamp and others can speak to this. If we could fix your every problem in 30 seconds, it would be fixed in 10. If we could fix it in 30 seconds, it would be fixed in 10. Some things that you are dealing with as a student, we are wrestling with as, a, as an administration and a faculty. Again, hear me, we are committed to you. The only thing that stops us from meeting your needs in the immediacy is the processes we must deal with within the university. And we are trying to figure out how to build out a healthier, stronger, more robust school theology so that we can make sure that your issues are being addressed while you are communicating them to us. Now there are hundreds who won't hear that today. And so they might send that email again. But I've made a decision, I'm gonna send one back. So you will receive from me as students in email, resetting the culture of how we interact with each other. It's my responsibility. Because I want the faculty to enjoy this as much as the students. And these are honorable women and men who have done the work, and thus they do the work with you, okay? So you're the first to hear that from me directly. And so, um, so kind of as a, as a segue, I want you to think about some of the challenges that you had as a student, whether it's your first year or third year, second year. I want you to think about some of the demands that have been on you to work, to do this work. And I want you to, I want you to hear attentively what I think is gonna be extremely helpful. I'm a continual learner, and becoming dean of this school has thrust me into a whole new learning season of my life, right? You know, I pastor a church. I thought I, was, I, thought I didn't have to learn anything else, right? I pastor a church. I thought I had 27 years, I'm good, right? I come here and I discover that God wasn't done teaching me. And I've been blessed to have a lot of teachers and helping and mentors as we do this work. So as I, as I prepare to hear him, I want you to be prepared to open your heart because I believe that there's so much in today that will inspire you to keep walking through this process. So can we put our hands together for Dr. West? Yeah. She said yes. Good morning, good morning. Uh, y'all look like y'all stressed already. <laughs> You're not supposed to come stressed. <laughs> Hope I'm not causing the stress. So good morning, and uh, 
Dean, thank you so very much for this opportunity uh, to share on um, this. I call it seminaries of stress, but I want to talk about stress not only as a seminarian, but you know, also as clergy. Um, because I don't think that we uh, have stress in just one area um, of our lives. So let me uh, just first start with some, with some definitions. You can go ahead and change the, there we go. thank you so much. Mental health, I wanna talk about, first talk about the definition of mental health and mental um, illness. So mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and our social well-being. Uh, mental health affects how we feel, how we think, how we act, and it also determines how we handle stress, how we relate to others, the choices that we make uh, every day, and it's important at every stage of life, from childhood and since through adulthood. And so that's the uh, definition of mental health from mentalhealth.gov. And then the World Health Organization also provides us with a definition of mental health. A state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own, his or her own abilities can cope with the normal stresses of life and work productively and fruitfully is able to make a contribution to his or her community. So that's a definition for World Health Organization. And then we go from mental health to mental illness, because sometimes people uh, use those terms interchangeably, and they're not interchangeably, they're really different. And so mental illness refers to conditions that affect the person's thinking, feeling, mood, or behavior. Um, these can include, but aren't limited to, depression or anxiety, uh, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia. Usually, usually a mental illness is something that's diagnosable in the DSM-5. It is usually associated with distress or impairment in important areas of function. And so generally, when we have a mental illness, it's associated with a distress either in our areas of work, uh, social areas, our home areas, areas of relationship. And then the next definition I want to share with you is stress. A state of worry or mental tension caused by the difficult situation. Stress is a natural response that prompts us to address challenges and threats in our lives. And everyone experiences stress to some degree. Everyone experiences stress to some degree. The question is, how do we respond to it? How do we respond to it? Because the way that we respond to stress makes a big difference in our lives. And so uh, a familiar scripture for me, of us, uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, uh, just a few of the verses. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent the messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba and Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom brush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. This is extreme stress. This is extreme stress. Because what Elijah had got word that someone's going to take his life. Now many of us don't have that level of stress that we have to deal with every day. However, I would like to ask the question, have you ever said like Elijah, I've had enough, Lord. I've had enough with academics. I've had enough with the church. I've had enough, Lord, take it away. 
is just way too much because we do have these uh, challenges, uh, these challenges in life. You know, I remember when I was a naive Christian. You know, when you first get saved and the joy of being saved, and nobody tell, told me this, but for some reason I had an expectation that, you know, I'm going through the rose bush without the thorns. And if there were going to be thorns, surely they weren't going to be in the church. Not with Christians. Surely they were not going to be in the church. But what I didn't understand that they were Christians or we were Christians, but they were also people. We are also people. And so we do have um, challenges. Next slide, please. And so we talk about um, uh, pastoral challenges. It's kind of feeling, you know, and there, there are numerous pastoral challenges. You know, feeling isolated is a challenge. Um, the negative impact pastoral can have on your family. And you, you, def, you don't necessarily have to be a pastor to have these challenges. Uh, but if you are a pastor and the, the membership declines, or the finances decline, or you're disrespected by church members, or you're dissatisfied with the job, or you have little to no support, or you have a vision given by God and nobody wants to um, join you in this particular vision. There are numerous challenges that pastors face. But the number one challenge, you can go ahead and click it for me, the number one challenge for pastors who consider quitting is it stuck? I'll move forward, you can catch up. So the number one challenge for pastors who consider quitting, the number one challenge was the immense stress of the job. This is Barnard. <laughs> For pastors who considered quitting, the number one challenge was the immense stress of the job. The number one challenge for pastors who did not consider quitting was the immense stress of the job. So whether you go or whether you stay, the immense stress of the job was the number one challenge for pastors. So what I want to do is share with you, uh, first of all, five uh, stages of stress. Five stages of stress. And there's, first of all, there's this fight or flight stage. So, you know, when we perceive that there's some kind of threat that's going on, it's the fight or flight stage. You know, um, you know, years and years and years ago, you know, the fight or flight stage was very uh, necessary because many of the threats were physical threats. You know, where, you were, where, where, where they're trying to run from an animal, or be threatened by an animal, or those kinds of things. Many of us don't have those kind of threats. Now, most of our threats now are psychological, mental, emotional. You know, some, somebody disrespects you, somebody threatens you, somebody changes something. And so we have the fight or flight stage. And when that happens, you know, our heart rate will increase, our focus will drop, and um, our body begins to fill with adrenaline and our muscles will tighten up. And so the fight or flight stage is to get us in a position to be able to handle whatever threat that comes. And generally, it's, you know, it's not a, um, it's not something, it's not something that happens to us when we find ourselves in fight or flight. We can make a decision whether or not we're going to stay in there and deal with it or walk away from that situation. So that's the impulse that we feel of whether we are going to fight or whether we are going to um, flight. And so when we're at school or when we're in ministry, you know, our fight or flight can be triggered by a lot of things. 
You know, can't be triggered by that. You got to take this test. You know, this paper is due. Or you have a conflict with your group members, with your presentation. Or you have a conflict with your professor, uh, Dr. West. Well, they go Dr. West because we know West and stress don't go together. So. <laughs> So, or it could be in ministry, right? You know, dealing with some of the things that we talked about, whether it's the members, disrespecting, uh, the things that are not going on right in the church, it could put you in that fight or flight. So that is, um, that's stage one of, of stress. And so our body begins to feel, begin to feel with this adrenaline to help us deal with the stress that we are, are experiencing. Stage two, damage control. Damage control. So if that if that threat you have continue and it's going on and it's increasing, you know, so whatever it is, our body is trying to help us sustain in that fight or flight mode. And so the cortisol will be released. And um, what the cortisol is going to do, it's going to start flooding our system. And it's going to be flooding our system to help us be in a space where we can sustain that mold because we are trying to deal with whatever that threat is. And so, you know, when, when, when this is happening on short term, right, it's not going to do any serious damage to our system because we move from the damage control to the recovery mode. And the recovery mode is telling us, our body is telling us, okay, take a break. Take a break. And the reason is because our bodies cannot continually to be in that fight or flight mode long term because otherwise it's gonna cause damage. So we get to stage three, which is kind of recovery. So after that initial rush of adrenaline and cortisol, our bodies need to reset. Uh, and so generally we feel it because we're exhausted and we're fatigued. And then our body is telling us, get some rest because we can't continue to move like we're moving. So this is the time we're supposed to take a step back to do some self care and do whatever we need to do so our body can replenish itself. And so when we pay attention to the recovery stage, then we can, you know, kind of move, quote unquote, back to normal. However, if we don't pay attention to the recovery stage, we move to the next stage, which is adaptation. And what happens is that we have to convince ourselves or say to ourselves, this is going to be long-term stress. So remember, we're already fatigued and we're already worn out, but we stay in that particular mode. We stay in a mode where the uh, where we have said to ourselves that you know we went to stage one about fight or flight, went to stage two about damage control, and then we can either we skip the recovery stage, so we keep on going. So that means that the cortisol and adrenaline and the adrenaline, all that stuff is still flowing through our body. And, and so doing adaptation, we tell ourselves that this level of stress is going to be here for the foreseeable future. And the one, one, of, one of the things we do, uh, particularly as clergy, whether it's in the church or clergy as students in, the, in, in, in seminary, we make what is not normal, normal. Wow. And when we, when, we receive, when we receive it as normal, we just keep on, you know, we just keep on going, and we keep on going, and we, and we keep on going, and we keep on going. But what we are moving into are the negative effects of long-term stress, of long-term stress. You know, where we can be irritable. Uh, where we, and sometimes, you know, you know, the people around us, or family members or friends, and you'll say, well, why are you irritable? Uh, 
We may not even know how to say it. We may not even have the words because we don't see ourselves as being irritable because the long-term stress has made us think that this is normal. And so, you know, we'll have poor sleep patterns. We won't be eating right. We'll be fatigued. We'll have, we'll start second guessing ourselves. Um, I remember 2011, that's the best year my, my father died. He was in, in Hampton. And so, and I remember, you know, when he got sick, we in the hospital, just leaving here, driving down there, coming back, driving down there, coming back, driving. So I won't sleep in right, and I definitely won't eat right because it's all fast food. You know, I knew I had to eat, so, you know, stop here, get something to eat, drive down there, go back, drive down there. Um, then, you know, and then my dad passed. And, you know, and I know I wasn't feeling well, I mean, but, I, you know, but I was gone. So I went to the doctor, the doctor said, well, son, you got walking pneumonia. And I was just going, I had heard of walking pneumonia. I didn't know what it was until I experienced, but I just kept on going and going and going and going. And the truth of the matter, I can't blame, you know, what he was going through on me, because I could have still could have taken care of myself even as I was going back and forth. But sometimes what we do, now think about this clergy, because we spend a, a, we spend a lot of energy taking care of others. A lot of energy taking care of others. Um, and you know, an individual will tell you they thank you and they appreciate you, but the next individual will come and say, you know, I need you. You know, and I remember this distinctly when I was working full time in the church and doing my um, PhD, I remember distinctly, you know, the members were happy for me. You know, you know, Dr. Reverend West, that's what they call Reverend West, you know, you go and get that doctor degree, you know, we're happy for you. Now, Reverend West, I need you to be at my first cousin's funeral that they never came to church. You know, I remember visiting members in the church after I'd been there for a couple of years. You know, I go to the hospital and they say, who are you? I'm just saying, the way that we extend ourselves. And so a lot of times our ministry responsibilities wear us out, then we still have school. You know, I'll just use myself as an example. You know, you've been in my class, you don't come to my class and say, well, Dr. West, I had to preach last night, that's why I didn't do my paper. We stay up. Get it done, move on to the next thing. Even if that means lack of sleep, lack of eating, whatever it may be. And then finally we get you after adaptation, the next stage is burnout. And burnout is the result of long-term unresolved stress. This can be defined as the loss of meaning in our work, loss of meaning in our school, coupled with our mental and emotional or physical exhaustion. And for some, it may even lead to further physical and mental health complications. So the goal really is, because uh, it's, it's not a question of whether stress is going to come in our life. It's a question of how we're going to navigate it, how we're going to manage it. And the goal is, you know, once we get to that fight or flight, that damage control is to be intentional about recovery. When we don't go, when we, when, we, when we omit recovery, then we try to look at it as this is a normal part of our life. Uh, and then there, after that, though, it may be to uh, burn out. Next slide, please, sir. And so, what this does is has an effect on our nervous system. And so the, 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 this, this, this stress, this fight or flight. And so we have the auto, autonomic nervous system is named because it works autonomously, you know, without a person's conscious effort. You know, so we don't have to tell our nervous system what to do. It is just unconsciously, it's gonna, it's gonna, do, it's gonna respond for us like it needs to. Next, sir. 
And so there's two, two, two parts of the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Next slide, sir. And so the difference between the two, right, the sympathetic nervous system uh, is the, one of the two main divisions of the autonom autonomic nervous system. And its primary purpose is to stimulate the body's fight or flight response. That's the sympathetic. So when we feel, when we feel challenged, when we feel threatened, the sympathetic nervous system starts to uh, respond. And then the other, the other one is the autonomic nervous system. And this is a, this is a nervous system, this is the nervous system that really, you know, tries to give us homo, homostasis, it tries to keep us a balance, it tries to uh, be there for us to, to rest and digest our feed and breathe um, activities. Next slide, sir. And so just, um, just some comparison between the two, the sympathetic versus the um, parasympathetic. Sympathetic's involved in fight or flight, and the parasympathetic is involved in maintaining homeostasis, homeostasis, just to keep our body calm. Sympathetic prepares the body for danger. The parasympathetic aims to bring the body to a state of calm. The sympathetic increases the heartbeat, you know, our muscles will tense up, and the parasympathetic reduces the heartbeat and our muscles will relax. Uh, the sympathetic uh, pupil dilates to let more light in, and the parasympathetic the pupil uh, contracts. And so, what, what you know, what we what we don't want to do is keep our body in the uh, where the sympathetic is activated it, because it's not supposed to be activated long term. And so, what it, so these are these are just uh, some of the some of the things that happens between between the two. So, if you look up top, you can read, you know. So, on a parasympathetic, which is the one we want to be um, in mostly, that's that's the part of the uh, the nervous system we want to be activated mostly. You know, our our, our pupils will constrict, but in the sympathetic, it'll dilate the pupils. And the parasympathetic, uh, it stimulates uh, saliv sal salivation, and the sympathetic, it inhibits us from salivating. And the parasympathetic, you know, our heartbeat will de decrease, and the sympathetic, our heartbeat rate increases. And the parasympathetic, our digestive activity does what it's supposed to do, and the, and the sympathetic, it will be inhibited. And so, mostly on the sympathetic side, the things that our body wants these to do normally will be restricted or will be inhibited because we are in fight or flight mode. Next slide, please, sir. So, these are some of the consequences of unresolved stress. We'll get dissatisfied with ministry. Or we'll get dissatisfied with being in school. There's decreased productivity. Our commitment is reduced. We may have impaired physical health, and that may be things like headaches, uh, muscle tension, uh, fatigue, upset stomach, or we have sleep problems, loss of purpose. We may have emotional problems. We may feel isolated or be lonely. Because, because one of the things that happens, right, is that when we get in this, 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 this state, we don't want to be around anybody. And so we'll do what we need to do, but we don't, want to, we don't have a, a drive to be around others. Next slide, sir. Some other consequences, our self-esteem could be lowered. We may have conflict in our relationships, a substantial loss of closeness and enjoyment in relationships. You know, so we don't want, we don't want to be bothered by anybody, you know, whether that's um, personally or professionally. 
It can lead to things like depression and anxiety, uh, low self-esteem, and excessive anger. So I want to share with you, I uh, want to make sure you got this, this visual of this stress bucket. So I want to talk for a few minutes in detail about our stress bucket. And so you see, you see the bucket, and then above the bucket you see these, what I call stress faucets. So, you know, in the, in the, in the bucket itself, Right, the goal is to keep the stress level down. The goal is to keep the stress level down because too much stress will cause our stress buckets to overflow. And so one of the ways we keep the stress level down is we'd be able to utilize some healthy coping skills. And, and you see, uh, and the, you know, the stress level in everybody's bucket is gonna be different. You know, when I think about the stress level, the, the amount of stress that you can navigate in a healthy way. You know, wherever that is in your bucket, it may be in the middle, maybe lower, but whatever your stress level is, the distance between that and the top of the bucket where it overflows is kind of your buffer zone. It's kind of your buffer zone. And so the lower the stress level, the greater the buffer zone. You know, the higher the stress level, then the lower the uh, buffer zone. So let's talk about what these stress bucket, the stress faucets up top can be. Uh, next slide, sir. And so, um, you can go to the next one. So the stress faucets, one could be academic stress. And so these are the faucets that are pouring into your buckets, pouring into your stress bucket. And so it could be um, academic stress. You know, academic stress could be something associated with you know, the, the amount of time you have to study, uh, the, the, the greater your study load, the, how you perform on papers or, um, or tests. You know, because some of y'all are like, I had a student, you know, say to me, what, what is that, what is that minus behind my A? <laughs> and it got me, it shocked me at first and I understood. She was, she said, well, I'm not supposed to get a minus behind my A. So, you know, when we have whatever the expectations are and the expectations don't come through, that may cause us some stress. Conflict with professors may cause some stress. Conflict with group members. Conflict with your peers. That may, that may be how your um, academic stress faucet pours into your bucket. The next one is interpersonal. So our interpersonal stress um, faucet. And so this interpersonal comes from our interactions with people in our daily lives. You know, people that we're in a relationship with. And so that can include having an argument or a disagreement or conflict with your significant other, uh, your family members, your friends, uh, your parents. That's interpersonal. The interpersonal stress faucet may pour into your bucket. Intrapersonal within. Intrapersonal stress, things within ourselves, particularly our mind and our body. And so this could be mental health challenges, uh, if we're dealing with depression or anxiety, or we have some financial concerns, or something with a poor, poor diet, you know, any of those things that we deal with uh, internally, uh, that intrapersonal stress can pour into your, to your bucket. Uh, you know, I realized, you know, when I talk, when I talk to clients, you know, sometimes I say, you, you, as I hear you talking, I want you to realize how you created stress for yourself. And so, years ago, when I recognized that for myself, and so, what I do at the beginning of the week is think about my week and say, okay, look. I said, and I say to God, I said, God, I know that somewhere along this week, 
stress is gonna come. Help me to do my best and not to create it for myself. Not to create it for myself. Because others, you know, interaction with others, it may come. And so what I'm trying to do is diminish the amount of stress I create for myself. You know, and that could be simply, that could be simply, you know, so uh, if I have a class to teach on Friday, maybe if I prepare my lesson plan on Monday instead of Thursday night, I'll be better off. You know, whatever the little things are in my life that I could do to diminish the stress for myself. And then another, another faucet would be environmental. So environmental stress comes from changes or conflict within our surroundings, uh, particularly including our work or our uh, living uh, environments. And that may be, you know, conflict with coworkers, that may be changes in responsibilities on our job, that could be, uh, you know, roommates arguing, that could be we move into a new home, or that could be the repairs need to be done in the home. That could be a whole lot of things. But that could be, you know, the environment. Environmental stress. And so, you know, so if we talk about these kind of stress faucets, and there could be other faucets that are pouring um, into, a, into our stress buckets. And so when we think about the faucets, there can also be multiple faucets pouring at the same time. You know, so for instance, this is say that you and your spouse are co-pastor in the church. And you have a disagreement at the church. So you're going to be dealing with some environmental stress and interpersonal stress. And so multiple faucets can be pouring in at the same time. Uh, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if your pastor is also your seminary professor, that happens sometimes. <laughs> and so, you know, if something goes on at the church or something goes on at the school that you have a disagreement about, you know, a grade or something, then that it would, it would take conscious efforts to not, I mean, it would take conscious efforts to separate one of those environments from the others, but a lot of times we don't. Because we just see the person that we mad at, or in disagreement with. And so the, 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 the stress faucets can pour into our stress buckets more than one um, at a time. Next slide, please, sir. So back to you know the, the visual again. So you can see you have those faucets up above that are pouring into, but you also see there's some faucets attached to the bucket. Because the faucets that are attached to the bucket, I look at those as you know coping skills. You know the coping skills faucets. And there, are, on this particular one, there are three. Coping skills, and so one of them, the one to the left, is an unhelpful, unhelpful, and I'll say unhealthy. So what happens is when we have unhelpful coping skills. So what do you mean by that, right? Those are the ones that provide a short-term relief, but causes us more trouble in the long run. So yeah, you can go drink, and it'll go away for a minute, but it's not gone. You can go do some drugs, and it'll go away for a minute. You can go do some emotional eating, but it's not going to take the stress away. And so let me tell you what happens. That particular faucet, because it's temporary, the stress relieves, but then it comes right back in. And so it just flows right back into the stress bucket. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not God in the way. We, then we can find ourselves in this cycle that is hard for us to get out. Uh, and then the two other faucets, you have a problem-focused coping skills. And so 
if you're able to navigate and deal with the source of the problem because of you know whatever influence you may have over the situation then we can focus on how to problem solve sometimes we don't have that kind of influence over the problem you know so for instance let's say again you're in dr west class and you see me as a problem because this work I got you doing. And you come and talk to me and Dr. West says, well, we're not gonna change the assignment. So the assignment's not changing. So then we have, then it's helpful for us to deal with our emotion-focused coping skills. Because when you cannot, so if you can't change the situation, how do you change yourself? You know, I talk to clients a lot of times and they're blaming something to somebody else and somebody else should do this. I said, what about you? How do you, if, you know, this is the same thing we talk about faith. You know, how do you allow God, to, how do you allow your faith to work in a situation where you pray and ask God to change the situation and God said, I'm not going to change the situation. The situation is not going to change. I need you to change in the situation. Because sometimes, you know, one of the things I do for myself, and I learned this years and years ago, um, when, I, when I figured out, I can't stop, I have to stop blaming the folk. And so I asked myself, God, what is it that you're trying to teach me? What is it you want me to learn? What is it you want me to do? Because I, you know, I got tired of being in second grade. You know, we can't go to second grade and third grade and fourth grade. You can't keep on being promoted until we get to the lesson. And one thing I do, you know, for my life, that God, if God wanted me to learn a lesson, if I change the situation, the lesson didn't change until I learned it. Until I learned it. And so sometimes when the problem, or at least what we see as the problem, or that doesn't change, how do we focus on our own emotional skills to help that change? So, so when you think about your stress bucket, think about what comes, what is coming through, what is pouring in it. Uh, and I think even more important is what are we doing with it? Are we allowing, are we allowing our buckets to fill up? And not, and we don't have little to no uh, coping skills uh, faucets that are releasing there. So one of the things I like to tell students, right? You know, when you when you decide, we put, when you answer God's call to come to seminary, it's not just another dish on your plate. It's a whole nother plate. It's a whole nother plate that we have to navigate. That means, you know, uh, just, just like Elijah, right? Doing God's will doesn't dismiss us from having stress. God don't put us in a room and say, because you said yes to me, that everything's going to be peachy cream. And so part of our, you know, growing in the faith, growing in who God created us to be is to is to navigate the, some of the challenges that we that we have, and when we're thinking about it in terms of stress, how do we do that uh, with the the coping skills? And so, what are some strategies? Next slide, please. There are strategies for mental well-being. I'm almost finished here. Um, you can go to the next one. And the next one, I think I did all that. <laughs> all right, so of course you know I'm gonna say therapy. Uh, therapy, one of the reasons, well not yeah, the reason, the reason that after I had um, completed two master's degrees and a PhD, the reason I went back to school to get a degree in counseling was to be a resource for clergy. <coughs> Because after being here at the school and talking to clergy and listening to clergy, the bottom line is that we have our own struggles. 
and if we're honest with ourselves, there are very few people we can talk to that we trust. Because you can't, you know, remember saying, well, well, how are you doing? You can't stop and say, all hell breaking loose in my body. <laughs> and, and in addition to that, you know, we have, unfortunately, we have built up a culture where we don't trust each other. And, it, and, it, and, you know, sometimes it's hard to trust each other, right? When, um, you know, you apply to each other. I remember one of the students uh, we, were sh we were sharing a few years ago because he had applied to a church and he shared with his friend that he had applied to the church. And next thing he know, his friend applied to the same church. And so, and so sometimes we can't even um, talk with each other. And, then, and, and, you know, sometimes for me, we don't need to talk to each other. We need to talk to somebody who is uh, not connected to us, so that we can really we can really flow. You know, I remember I had a clergy person. And this is probably the, the third session she came into. You know, because the first two sessions she was, um, you know, she was she was sharing, but she wasn't really sharing. The third session she came into me. She said, "Look, since I talked to my friend, he said to me, he said, he said, let me get this straight." You mean you paid him to talk to him and you're not talking to him. <laughs> yeah, and so and so we need to release because we can't continue to carry all of this stuff that comes with ministry, that comes with being in school, that comes with being a seminary student. We, we our bodies are not designed for us to carry this stuff over and over again and for um, our bodies to be in a fight or fight mode as if that is normal. So ther a therapy, personal faith. So let me tell you what I mean by personal faith. What I mean by personal faith is that you spend time praying for you. You spend time, we spend, not you, we spend time, we spend time reading for us, not reading to do a sermon, not reading to do a lesson plan, to teach, but our own, how are we nurturing our own relationship with God? Even in seminary, right? Because it, 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 it can be challenging. It can be challenging. You have, you know, your academic responsibilities and your ministry responsibilities. Most of us, many of us, have ministry responsibilities. Any of y'all, did, 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 your, did, your, did your church say to you, we are so happy that you are going to seminary, take three years off, and then when you finish, come back and resume your duties? No, no, there, there's an expectation that all this will continue, and, and so how do we nurture our own relationship with um, God? You don't want to spend three years in seminary and you, you're so excited about graduating, and then when you graduate, God says, well, reintroduce yourself to me. So our, our, our personal, our personal uh, relationship with God is important. Our, um, to be able to eat healthy, you know, these are, um, to, to eat healthy, and the next one, a proper rest, and exercise, these are the things that we hear over and over and over again, uh, not just for stress, but just for self-care, just for self-care, and it is absolutely, um, absolutely uh, necessary, absolutely necessary. You know, the way that we eat, uh, the way that we sleep, or the way that we don't sleep, and our bodies don't get rest, that not only are not getting rest, that means that they're also not being restored. Our mind too. Do you know your mind needs to rest? You know because being in, being in clergy and being being in school, you know our minds can go twenty four seven, right? Because because ministry doesn't stop. Ministry doesn't stop. Y'all remember that that sermon you preached last Sunday where everybody was excited to praise you about? Guess what? Tomorrow they want the same. 
When I say the same, not the same sermon. <laughs> but they won't. So, so, so that that excitement and, and joy that ends, you know, when you finish preaching on that Sunday, and then we, you know, and we don't, you know, generally as clergy or as pastors, we don't wait till next Sunday. That following Monday or later that Sunday, we're already thinking about how are we going to, and if we're honest with ourselves, you know, it's stressful just right in the sermon. Because we're thinking about not all of, I mean, so you've done all the stuff that you're supposed to do that you learn in homiletics, but then you're thinking about how the people going to receive it. And then you got to think about, if y'all don't like me, I remember when I was pastoring, I, you know, I mean, a thought would come to my mind, and I'd put it on the paper, and I said, oh, man, I can't say this. The reason I can't say this is because Brother uh, Leroy going to think I'm talking about him because this is something he was dealing with in his life, and although it's not about him, it's really, but those are the things that we think about. It's not like we can we just write it down and then everything comes, you know, we just go with it. There's a, it's, stress comes with it. To the point for some of us, until we preach the sermon. Until we preach the sermon. So, so, so all of these strategies, uh, therapy, personal faith, uh, take care of our bodies, the way we eat, the way we uh, rest, the way we exercise, next slide, sir. Um, Relaxation techniques, meditation, yoga, deep breathing, connecting with people who care about you. Now, notice I did say just connecting with people. Connecting with people who care about you. So you can have conversations with people. So, so in other words, you want to be able to be social. And whether you're introvert or extrovert, there's still some benefits of being social. And you know, and I'm really referring to people that we can be around that we don't have to be on guard. That we don't have to be on guard. Because whether we recognize it or not, it causes stress sometimes to be around people that we have to keep our guard up. Establishing healthy boundaries, um, prioritizing our responsibilities, and making sure that we have some um, personal personal time. What time are we speaking of time? What time are we running? We, am I over, sir? Okay, so let me just give you this thing. I have for you, and I'm gonna ask you to just to take your five minutes to do it, a strength scale. It won't, this won't, this, this is won't, this won't take long, but it, but it will give you, it will help you tap into some, um, the why of your stress. Uh, the why of your stress. Uh, this particular um, stress scale is really asking you to uh, look at your level of stress over the last year. Over the last year. And so you just take a couple of minutes to fill, fill that out.
Okay, let me just end with, I hope that this can be helpful for you. Um, and you, as you can see on that sheet, you know, some of these things that uh, can also cause stress to our, to our lives are good things that happen to us. You know, we, what we call good things that happen to us, it doesn't necessarily, but that doesn't necessarily mean that stress doesn't come with it. Um, and then you can see particularly, you know, depending on how your score is, uh, what you might want to look at. And then at the bottom there, it, it shares you some of the things that overstress can cause and uh, deal, with your, deal with your body. Okay, all right. Anybody over 500? <laughs> okay, any, um, any, any questions for me before we move forward? Any thoughts, questions? Yes, sir. What, what did you say? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Oh, he, oh, I'm sorry, one of the, um, uh, he, he just said that his number was 415 and he needs to do something for himself. And I said, yes, yes. And, and we can talk if you want, okay? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Because, um, you know, the, the thing is, right, you want to take some action for yourself. Because it, if not, action is going to happen to you. It, it, will, it, will, it will happen to you because it, it just doesn't go away. Um, out of that. All right, any other thoughts or questions? Uh, yes? Yes, yeah, so, so the question was, when something positive happens, does the stress come and now what's next? Because generally when something positive happens, we navigate it healthy, in a healthy way. And, and it helps us to move on. So our stress, we run our stress buckets, our stress level, it doesn't get to the point where it overflows because we are navigating it and then we are releasing that, that stress because of the, uh, the positivity. Does that help? Any other thoughts, thoughts, questions? A few weeks ago I listened to an NPL Alpine program and they were talking about you know, anxiety and stress and depression kind of uh, issues. And they said uh, some anxiety, even though it feels bad, you know, there might be good anxiety because anxiety is distinguished from stress. Stress is kind of a condition that we can't control. So uh, do you think, you know, is, is there a way we can distinguish between both? Yes, so for instance, right, there, um, there are, some people may get, anxious right before they speak, right? So that, that's, um, that can be healthy because it helps us, it helps us put it, puts us in a place where we are not um, arrogant about it. And so, you know, the, the thing about preaching, right? I know, I know, no matter when I preach, there's some anxiety right before. Uh, and what it does for me is I, I, I it, it, you know, what it does for me is that I release it to God. I say, okay, God, this whole thing, you know, is this is about you. And so, and so, to your, to your, to your point, it can be, it can be helpful. You know, it, it only becomes when, you know, when it, when it becomes um, chronic for us, or it becomes a place where the anxiety is normal for us. You know, so, uh, so a lot of clients who have anxiety, what we try to do is teach them how to navigate that um, in a healthy way. Because we don't always navigate it in a healthy way, so it doesn't, and, and that's when it becomes, it can become um, harmful for us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. <laughs> so well, I want to thank you for giving me a test that that was stressful. I appreciate it. Test taking it was stressful. Uh, can we celebrate the gift of Dr. Westwood? Dr. Mayor, Dr. Mayor, what a, uh, every time that I, the two times I've heard you on this matter have, they, it's been necessary. I, I think one of the reasons why 
this session was important for us to um, for him to, to share is because the demand of what we do in ministry and I don't I don't believe in a post pandemic anything. My language is pandemic impacted because every time I see someone wear a mask on a plane, that's a reminder of what we've been through the last three years. When I see um, when someone coughs and like everybody's response is, oh God, right? Like I was on a plane coming here and a couple of people coughed and it's like everybody, you could tell the whole cabin went to, oh my God, we're all going to die together, right? It's just the world we live in. Even, even for us here, where you know, uh, you know, we, you know, Dr. Jansen, who provides leadership in terms of, in terms of the development of our core schedule, even the conversations we're having to about trying to get us to return to in person. And you know, a lot of our professors are incredible at in person, but many of us have been challenged with this online, you know, instructional approach. And because it's, it's challenging, you know, to keep telling students, don't go on black, don't go on black, don't go on black. And then you start sounding like you're, you know, angry and dictatorial and whatever else. I can't think of any other words. And so the professors are trying to keep you engaged and you're trying to manage four hours of a screen. The stress of that, that that has placed on them and you. So it's important that we, have, you know, so one of the things that, you know, I've been really thinking about, praying about, is that we need to, you know, consider as a required course, something on mental health. Because it's important that we are a part of your formation. Seminary is a, is a place of formation. So we have to do, yes, we have to do biblical studies and we have to do practical theology such as preaching and other things. But we also need to be intentional about your formation, about your personal development. You are, you are three years with us. So we have to care, you know. Field education has to also prepare you for the work you're probably already doing but help you do it better. Right? So thank you, Dr. West. You you are a gift to us. And we give God great praise for you. Amen. So what we're gonna do is it's 10 16, so we're gonna take a break, come back, and we'll we'll start at 10 30 with this much needed conversation. Please, you know, go on Facebook, you know, you know, do, you know, do a couple of things. One, uh, you know, take some take some pictures. We could classmates and faculty post it on Facebook and put community for you know hashtag community formation uh, 2023 and you know um, Sister Robin who is a student uh, but is um, also working with us in terms of social media and some other things because I do understand that the that the men before me one day there should be a woman dean but the man before me uh, probably didn't have to do social media and branding and recruitment. That's one of the changes that occurs. And even even recruiting courses, you know, you know, recruiting in terms of courses and that kind of thing. We never have to worry about that, you know. When I came here, your you know, your first semester was Jones, Sanders, Ross, uh, the trifactor. <laughs> I jokingly said last night to Dr. Sanders, because Dr. Sanders was was one of my professors. And it's always, you know, coming back here to come back to a place where now you're working with someone who is your professor. And so I jokingly talked about how Dr. Miles Jones kind of was the bomb in Gilead. Dr. Uh, Sanders and Dr. Ross were uh, theological samurais and they and they would chop us up and and, and, and leave us to die. 
right? But for some strange amazing reason, when they left us to die, they also created some form of resurrection. They always did. They always gave us hope that we could do this. And so it's exciting to be able to, to have this conversation with him and, and Dr. Hendricks. Dr. Hendricks, I, I, waited, to, I waited to say this to you. Um, last night's presentation greatly impacted my preaching voice. Um, if you can come to this place and not be impacted, then you are wasting valuable lifetime, life energy. Last night, I was up till almost 3 a.m. That's why it's funny when you text me talking about go to bed. I said this woman does not know God that, that well. But 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 last night I went went home and I started writing my sermon for Sunday. Because one of the stressors for me is that I'm the dean of this school, which is seven days a week. Right? We get emails all the time. We deal with issues all the time. Right? But then I have to preach. And I have to pastor. And some days I have to tell faculty and staff, I can't respond right now because I need to be the pastor of the St. Paul Church. Right? But it was interesting. I'm writing my, I began writing my sermon about the Good Samaritan. And I heard you. And it changed my whole approach to writing that sermon. My my preaching voice was impacted last night. Thank you. Yes, it's coming. In 30 days. Um, <laughs> that's another stress. <laughs> that's, that's another form of stress for me. But it, it, it impacted my preaching voice. And, and, and I think that one of the reasons you should come to the School of Theology, I had the privilege of listening to Dr. Sanders and Dr. Hendricks have a conversation with no moderator, just talking, and to sit and listen to scholars, black scholars, distinguished voices, just talk in casual conversation was transformational for me. And it's, and it's interesting as we transition to this conversation, I want you to think about the privilege of sitting in this space. Just the privilege. And we're streaming out of kindness. But we could be selfish and close this room. And only the people who made it the commitment, get the benefit of Dr. West and Dr. Sanders and Dr. Hendricks today. And so as you sit here, do not mismanage the fact that this is supposed to make you go back and look at every serving you thought killed them and ask, did it kill them or did it entertain them? Did it challenge them to grow, or did it give them permission to stay the same? Wow. That's what last night did for me. And here's the other piece. It made me no longer afraid to tell that truth for fear of rejection of those who are listening. Because if you can't preach the core of the gospel for fear that people will not celebrate your gift, then your gift is an illusion. Because we are called to this great work. So, all right, so we'll, we'll take a, take until about, about 10.35, and then, then so that gives us a chance to set up our, our moderator, um, and, and that gives us a chance to kind of set up. So those who are watching, please invite others, and again, take a few moments, take some pictures, post some stuff, send it to your classmates if you got those group texts, of classmates, send it to them. If not, you know that you know, that's not a bad thing to do to create some to create some space with some classmates, right? Um, you know, you know, connect to you know professors, and, and let's get ready at 10:35 for our next session.
we, and here's my other we, thought. When do we look at that process? When do we change that process in terms of getting a pastor to talk about giving us some time to, and see the problem with that is you gotta do more than one person. So how do I really get to know the person that we look at it again? And so my church specifically, Doc, this, I don't know about everybody else trying to, but four Baptists has had, I almost didn't get ordained. I, Past the very last, he was getting ready to ordain me. He left because of issues at the church. And they, the way he treated his family, this is what he said. Not, you know, so I had just gotten there, but I began that year. Then we had an interview. He got fired. The interview did. Then we were out with somebody for a year, then Pastor Jackson came. He resigned. So, for somebody like me, but the question is, so do I want this one? And uh, not uh, just uh, on both ends. Right. I want this one. The one is of a congregation that needs to be. Yeah. But then the truth is, that whatever group work on any side. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember that paper we did and we came up with that title? Part of that was because what I was dealing with. I, I remember that. You remember that title? Yeah, I remember that. It was, uh, who's class was it? We were in, uh, Rock and Zoom Channel. No, uh, no, no. Dance. Yes. Yes, yes, that yes, sermon title, yes. I kept milling around, yes. it came because a lot of what I was doing. I think we have some, I think we've become the sum total of what we're doing. And here's the truth that I'm learning. Some stress. You actually have to listen to stuff like that. I don't know what I'm called, they what good is that? And, and, and he, he helped me at Ellen. He did this one. Uh, yeah, I love this thing. <laughs> it made me think about this. This thing, not just ministry, but everything. What good am I if I burn my somebody? Honestly. Yeah. Because before I was really offended, I was. What good am I if I burn myself out in the name of God? You know, what I'm saying? You feel what I'm saying? And those closest to me. And you're worse than me. Well, I get the best of me. Exactly. To be honest, I told him about the other thing. Did I do? In terms of what you do here, um, so I'm looking to find someone that I felt you got my number at the church to come in and say, hey, here's what you need for your walk. I'm, I'm not thinking about what you are now. And I don't want to go. I'm thinking about how to show you and whether I'm going to be there or not. This is I'm what thinking about our, our ministry in terms of audio, visual, and what are some things. Maybe somebody can come in and say, here's what you guys will really need. We may, and I know there's levels to it. You, may, you ain't no love. St. Paul's level. But at least you want to be able to make sure your speakers are right. You want to make sure your microphones are right. We, we, I can tell you why. It would be my mind. And here's the one thing I love about this. You make great relationships with great people. You don't change much. And that's what you're saying. So I'm telling you. Tell me when. I'll be there. I'll be there. I don't let you know. I try to tell you from here to whenever you're coming to town. But right now we're just. I'm back and forth, though. Because I'm back. Let me tell you what happened to us on Sunday. So we had a speaker on Sunday. And I got it. Like that I, you know, we were having speakers come in. I went up there when we got in. Yeah, you know, you come in, I'm just on me, let me check the mic. Sure. The speaker gets the mic when they first get up, and just open the church up, and the mic ain't on. I look at the audio video, guy said, you can't do this in church right now. To myself, I'm leaving there, you living out here for 30, 45 minutes. Yeah. You walk around, check in the mic, and then you get up, and the mic ain't even working, they're open up there. You know, well, you know, this, and this. So I don't know if we got to invest in some different microphones, but it's about technology, it's possible. I'm going to tell you what I tell everybody. Where, at wherever you are, there's a way to act. What you got? Absolutely. What we're doing. Wherever your system is. Even so let's say you're to go we want to upgrade the phase. The first thing I come in is I'm going to do what I got. the last time we go to what I call the ring out. Go through every mic, every channel. We can do, we do everything. You know what I'm saying? Get the, uh, Press air, spray between. How do we, even if you go upgrade tomorrow, today, let's maximize it. You see what I'm saying? This is awesome. Now, because what that does is, while we begin to train on what the next thing is, you don't lose what you, you see what I'm saying? So, you don't have to suffer on a service. 
or are you trying to get a learning curve? So I think, let's say, well, let's say where you are, you might you also want to upgrade to a different point. But well, the first thing I'm looking at is, hey, let's do this thing. Because one thing I was asking about to do before we came up here is, I don't, I, I come in and do like, Okay, what do you guys want to be going to do this? So let's start talking about how does this operate while we still do it. So by the time we make that transition, there's at least a working knowledge. It just may mean that you've been waiting to do the hands on, which is not a problem. But we've kind of got some of what it could do. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it doesn't become a new system and it's intimidating to anybody. So we streaming right now on Facebook with uh, just my wife using her phone. Yes, sir. And I mean, it, it, it's only the people, it's only younger people in the church. So we don't live out there. That's how we use Ryan. It ain't because she did. It ain't because she did. The audio picture person, she just using net to set to allow some of the people to, 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 to be able to see it on Facebook and that kind of thing. And I'm sitting there saying, okay, well, we need a camera. I have a I have, let me tell you, here's the truth. I got this is my third, my first one is like this. I, and I got it at home. Pandemic is, my church has <laughs> But now I'm getting the whole two systems. I've always had a camera, like, I don't want to sit there. Yeah, but, okay. but I'm getting calls from friends and people that hey, how do we do it? You ready? Here's the truth. I'm going to offer up. So you actually on Facebook, but you're using the camera to stream as yeah. opposed to a phone. Like we would absolutely. Yeah. 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 The reason I did it was two reasons on my page, and I still have to stream my phone. But I would have to put my phone on do not disturb. Oh, gotcha. So if I get a call, it'll get a run. Right. But then the other piece was this is how we get a clean picture long distance. And you can get a camera and for two or three. So I was on Facebook one Okay. I'm okay. being honest with you. I am. And so that's just a this, hobby of that. This one I got for three fifty. Okay. Um, and I have some people in my bag, on the bag of the car, that I can come out of here right at the end. This, okay. this piece connects to the computer. Yeah. And this is what lets me stream it out to Facebook or okay. YouTube or whatever. Okay. But starting out what it did is, and I've done this for a it gives a fresh approach. Right. Now I'm fresh enough. I got it finished. Yeah. And then I use a, I use this uh, thing for stuff like this on the stream yard. Okay. What's it called? Stream yard. Okay. And I test it to you because here's what stream yard lets me do. Uh, I go on Canva or post on my wall and create the lower third. So what it allows me to do is create my lower third of speakers or whoever. Okay. It also allows me like I'm gonna do this now. Because we live, we stay in home. I got two, three people on. Pre recorded video. I say, and give them something to look at while we are in. Okay. So, before service, the announcement, whatever you want to do, okay. you can record it. And then, while you, again, like in this case, like the camera itself is off because right. you're on break. But it gives them something to do. Okay. You text my classmates and see if they tapped into. You know, into uh, what do we what we call uh, formation? So to me, it's just uh, it, 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 stuff like this. It, it, I love it because it allows me to have all my, you know, right. on the fly. I can, I don't gotta have a whole console full of stuff. Right. Everything I need right here. Okay. And that's all you need. And plus, but, but but the other side of that is if you were running music and everything else, you'd have a board or something probably. That would be the only other thing for the mic. I have I have a I have a feed that allows me to um, uh, audio feed. I didn't bring it today because uh -huh. I knew the system here that I'm dropping the mic. But there's a thing called a uh, audio focus right now. It's about hundred dollars. Okay. You come out of your soundboard. It, it connects to your computer. You come out of your soundboard with a mic cable or a four inch cable. Mm -hmm. So that now you have a direct feed. Okay. So now instead of having to use the 
I'm going to have to get with you now. Yes, sir. No. Okay. Good talking to you. You too. You too. If we could gather ourselves together as we have our conversation with our two distinguished scholars today. So I want to ask you to kind of gather down close, okay? We want a little intimacy um, this morning and also it will help us to be warm. <laughs> so let's gather together. <laughs> yes. I am so delighted uh, to be able now to have a conversation with uh, two awesome scholars, writers, but also two men who have great passion for God and passion for the church and passion for the gospel. And so we want to follow up a little bit in a conversation between uh, Dr. Hendricks and our own Dr. Boykin Sanders as we continue to gain insight even this in this pandemic impacted world in which we want to make sure the gospel is preached and also that the church uh, is doing the work of the gospel. And so the first question I want to start with and ask if both of you would share to begin the dialogue, I'm gonna ask about three questions and then Hopefully we'll have an opportunity to get two questions from, from you. But I want to start with, uh, we talked, uh, you talked, Dr. Hendricks, last night, a lot about reminding us that the gospel is not so much what we believe, but it's what we do. And so I want to ask both of, both of you to kind of share what you believe is central to the gospel. What you believe is central to the gospel. And whoever wants to start first. Fine. 
I defer to my distinguished, I didn't say extinguished, <laughs> distinguished cousin. <laughs> that. That is the truth about the matter. He preached, I came preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. See? But that was needed for the Corinthian community. A community that was already resurrected too much. Wow. Could you repeat that please? I repeat that uh, I am saying that in Corinth, Corinth, when he said, I came to Corinth, not in lofty words, but I came preaching death. Because that is the thing that saved you. Death, you need to die. And if you don't die, you're not in truth. Because your resurrection is your death. So the context itself determined what that really was. So I personally do not like black preachers that go around that have to get Jesus dead at the end of every sermon and get Jesus buried and get him up early on Sunday. Also be the death of the community. In other words, it can kill initiative. And that's what we need to do. That is in the context. Is to stop giving premature resurrections. And uh, that is at least the Corinthian community. And so it means this. And in the Gospel of Matthew that you use, especially, it would mean that uh, love God and your neighbor. That's true. That is needed for the Vatican community. But in Luke, it's something else. And 
like in the Gospel of Mark, it may be that you follow too much at a distance that you are unwilling to embrace this tragedy. And so a young man is following Jesus and uh, naked because the disciples won't. They will not follow. from the very beginning of my life that I was called to this ministry in order to help our people to come back from death. I saw the valley of dry bones and I said, can these bones live? Lord, you know. We have Dr. Wasanaki, Dr. Kelly. We have my colleague. You know, in the Bible. And evidently they have seen something too that we need to do, you know, for the people. And yeah, we have my good friend and my relative who is out there saying, hey, the gospel means this in this context. But what does it mean in the context of Virginia? and to black folks who have suffered slavery and all of the rest. In other words, I stopped reading over the parable of the uh, Good Samaritan, no, not the Good Samaritan, as the, the person, yeah, that's right, Good Samaritan. It will tell us about this person who, a uh, Levite, a priest of the Levite who saw a man in the ditch and uh, didn't go to take care of him. But a good Samaritan did. If it is a Samaritan that a good Samaritan has to do what two Jews, Jewish people could not do. Could have been. Yes. And so isn't it embarrassing that other people try to do for black people what black folks don't do for themselves? So what I hear you saying, I want to thank you, Dr. Gordon, for kind of sharing the passion of, and it really gets at the heart of, I think, what Dr. Henry brought in last night and shared about social justice being doing right by the community. But you also spoke a lot, Dr. Hendricks, about love as a central theme of the gospel. So did you want to share that first question I asked, what is central for you? Um, is, is it that love? And what, how do you define the love? What's central to me? Uh, It's not the church, it's the people. I, I grew up in the Black Nationalist Movement, I shared with some of you, in Newark, New Jersey, but I married Baraka. And uh, I expected you know, to die for the movement, to die for the people. And I tried <laughs> several times, and I was delivered. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> and I left the church because of uh, you know, what we saw as the uh, irrelevance of the church to the struggle. It's a long story, but I eventually came back to the church um, simply because that's where our people are. And I'll be honest, not because <clears throat> I uh, felt uh, such reverence for the church as an institution. So that was not it. That it was dedication to the, to the people. Because that's what the gospel is about. Jesus 
wasn't dedicated to the institution. In fact, that's, that's the reason they turned against him, right? And, uh, uh, and, and the priests were complicit in his death because uh, his dedication was to the people and not to the institution. So I just want to make that clear. That may sound heretical, but um, I think that's just part of the problem that we that often Christians are take too much pride in being Christian um, and not enough pride in being uh, servants of the people. Um, how do I understand love? I understand um, love as, um, I think love and justice are, are, are indivisible. Um, if you love someone, you want the best for them. And the best for them is to have uh, access to the best things in life. And that's what justice is about. And so I take a certain, uh, uh, my, my response is, might be different from, from some, but um, I think real love necessitates struggle, um, dedication to the welfare of the community, Real love hears music and the laughter of children and, and realize that, um, that if we don't do something that those children who are, <clears throat> who are laughing today might be crying tomorrow. So that's, that's how I entered in, into it. So I see my role as a biblical scholar, as I was saying to Brother Fred, um, as, um, as a support role. Right? You know, we, you pastors on the front line, you know, y'all are taking the hit, and y'all in the struggle, y'all in the fight, y'all in, in the trenches. Um, it's our, our role to try to, to, to be of support and give you, you know, tools. Um, um, and and, uh, some, and hopefully inspirational tools you know, to, to help wage that, that struggle, to make sense, uh, to make sense of it. Because as we know, <clears throat> for centuries, since we've been here in America, um, we, more than any other people, have been fed uh, <clears throat> the worst interpretations of Christianity and the gospel that, that, that there are. Um, and we've we suffered for it. Uh, how do we know we suffered for it? Because the most ignorant, hateful movement in years is winning. They're winning. Right wingers are winning. When you have a Marjorie Taylor Greene who's presiding over the people's house, yeah. this ignorant, hateful, racist, unapologetic racist, the fact that she's there means they're winning. The fact that they're reversing so many policies that we thought we'd never see reversed. We thought we had won the vote forever. And now they're closing the door on, the, on, on, on voting for so many people. So love for me says that if we really love, we claim that we love God and we claim and we love God's creation and we believe in the gospel and all that, then we should be out there fighting this thing, struggling. Our churches are supposed to are supposed to serve the common good and not just us. And so, I mean, I just have to say I'm so disgusted and disillusioned with what I see in the church. And folks saying, well, Jesus is coming back. Well, a whole lot of folks need to hope Jesus don't come back no time soon. Because what, what Jesus was finding something that, that I just would believe would, would disappoint and frustrate him to no end. Houses of entertainment. Houses that raise money just to build bigger houses. How is supported by senior citizens that do very little to support senior citizens? 
I'm sorry, I'm, I guess my frustration, my anger is coming out. But it's just, it's, it's just, it's just horrible. In the name of Jesus. But we have this gospel, which is powerful. And if we really cleave to this gospel, we can make such a difference in this in this country. I'm, I'm going to stop there because I'm going far afield from your question. So. No, this is, this is good because I think that, you know, because we are family having this conversation, I think that we also have to uh, release our frustration even as we look at where do we start, how do we get back on track, you know, and even when you talked about the church uh, having become institutionalized, but we know that the church is in essence the people. So how do we wear, and there's so many things that we can point to where the church got derailed, but uh, where do we start as every church now is talking about rethinking the church? You know, when, when we talk about rethinking the church, when pastors are meeting, conferences are being held, and that's the conversation, uh, where do we begin? Uh, Dr. Sanders, Dr. Hendricks, where do we begin to get ourselves back on course? You well, I'd, I'd like, I'd like to, to say to Chris, because I want to say something about Dr. Sanders and uh, uh, just how refreshing it is to hear, to hear that kind of, the kind of exegesis that, that, uh, that, that, that you share. Um, it's, it's sort of rare. I mean, the kind of mixture of passion and erudition and, and ex exegetical uh, brilliance uh, uh, that just effortlessly rolls off his tongue. No wonder you all call him distinguished uh, yeah. professor. Um, but the question was, where would you repeat that? Well, the whole thing of rethinking the church. Oh, rethinking. Well, you know, one thing, you mentioned you know, conferences. Go ahead, Doug. Strategize, and, and, and that's why they're winning. How can we strategize? 
how can we understand what the gospel is telling us to do to make this a more perfect and a more just world? That's not a question that we're asking at our conferences. Our conferences was, how can you uh, be more, how can I do this, Doc? Uh, how can I bring wood feather, Doc? You know, uh, and we just praise and, you know, and start saying a few things that make sense and folks stand all stands up. And the, yeah, go ahead, Doc. Preacher snake, Doc. You know what I'm talking about. And, uh, yeah, go ahead, yeah, and everybody stands up and, mm -hmm. go ahead. Preach this day. I am focused on, and you know, and, and, and then we can go out and what changes nothing except what people feel, not what they do. That, what is that? And, and so that's, that's what just, it just, it just kills me. So, okay, get to your questions. What do we have to do? Start strategizing, start asking questions. What does the gospel tell us to do in the world? How can we serve the people in this age? How can we fight capitalism? How can we stand up against this onslaught of the religious right that's looking that, that dehumanizes people? How can we do that? And I think that's what, what, what the gospel calls us to do. To summarize, I think what we really have to do is stand back and look at the gospel itself. And realize that the church is not what's most important, the people's most important. Jesus didn't have a church. He didn't have an institution. Now, in, of course, this institution had to grow, and it should have grown, but the institution is not. In fact, Jesus was a Christian, by the way, and he didn't have Christianity. What he had was the scriptures that, took that, that shared things a certain way. So for me, that's what it is. I, I have the gospel, I have the scriptures, that's what I study, that's where I'm, and um, the, the church is secondary, and it should be. It is to me anyway, and I think that is the way it's supposed to be. That's Jesus' example, so we want to follow Jesus, he said, follow me, he said, follow him, and, 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 and as he went out in the world changing things. You know, Nelson Mandela, um, and we all saw him, you know, familiar with how he did things. Nelson Mandela, when he was on the run, um, he would go here and there, raise questions. He'd go there and he'd, uh, and he'd, he'd uh, show up at a stadium and then he'd leave before they get arrested. Well, me, God's Lamar, Jesus did the same thing. He's always on the way. That's what you do when you try to raise people's consciousness to struggle and fight, right? That's not what we do. We get stuck in one place, and that's where we stay. That's, that's not following Jesus. That's not. And, and as far as the church, and on this rock I will build my church, my ecclesia, well, that means those called out, right? That doesn't necessarily mean an institution. What I'm suggesting is that the church is supposed to be a movement and not an institution as such, a, a, a static institution. And I, I think that's what we must start to do, look at our churches and our faith as part of a movement. And what that will do, I think, is take us out of our, our atomistic enclaves. Um, we. <clears throat> We can start working more together as churches and not just trying to glorify our own house so much and start to make a difference in the world. We have these. So, Brother Ferris told me he's from Detroit. You got a zillion churches in Detroit. Why can't some of them churches come together to do something for the folks? I mean, in a real substantive way, control the city. That's what a movement does, and that's what I think has to change, to see us, see us as part of a gospel movement, not part of a religion as such, or, or, or an institution or institutions. Um, and I'm not a hater on the church, don't get me wrong, I was raised in the church, and if you read, read the, uh, the first chapter, the introduction of, of, of my most recent book, I mean, I share what the church has been to me and the magnificence of what it gives to our people, the great love and the great, I mean, 
I thank God that I was raised in the church, man. And you know how the people who do you, you get up and mess up, saying your piece, and the, and the worse you mess up, the more they praise you. Go right. ahead, baby. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, you walk out and then they come in, come in, Charlie. Let's slip a mint in your hand, peppermint, or, or quarter, or nickel. And, you know, I mean, I, I learned what it meant to be dignified, you know. Um, all of that, that's, that's wonderful. The church is the only place where the masses of our people can, can be somebody and can be recognized in their full humanity. I love the, the church, so don't get me wrong, but the church is not, should not be the main point of our, uh, uh, of our commitment, in my estimation. What should be the main point of our commitment is the gospel itself. And to the extent that our church is are consistent with and serve the gospel in, um, then you know, fine. But the extent that they that they don't, they should be changed, or should they should be abandoned. There are some churches, in my estimation, that that really should no longer exist because they're not serving God by serving God's the needs of God's people, and and that is a part of this rethinking. How do we get the church back to what it was created to do, which is to be that group that spreads and lives and does the gospel? Yeah, Dr. Sanders, comment? Yeah, that's a really, really heavy question. You know, how do we do this? Um, for those of you who have known me for a long time now, that is in this community, as well as my professional life, um, I came from the other side of the water. And that side was the side of segregation. That's where I came from. I knew what happened in segregation in America. Not only in <laughs> what you call uh, imposed segregation, but there are people who actually believe that in order coming through black power and all the rest, that you shouldn't be asking other people to do your work that you actually should try to do it yourself. Self-reliance. That's the nature of our community. When you do not have something, necessity becomes the mother of invention. That is my life. That's my life. You know? I, you know, Aubrey has a history in Virginia. You started here in Virginia. Your family started here. In Farmville, Virginia. In Farmville, Virginia. That's where Vernon Johns was. I was born. <coughs> and that was my hero, one of them. I passed the Dexter Avenue King Memorial Church in Montgomery, just as he passed it, and Dr. King. All three of us passed at the same church. So this thing about self-reliance, is crucial in terms of getting the church back where it should be. There are people around the church on Sunday who would bring candy and sell it on the yard after the service was over. And all doing the church service, they would do it. See? And so that's crucial. But then what we did, as I think, was 1954 was a crucial turning point in black life. Brown versus Board of Education, the Beaker Kansas. That's when we lost control. We lost control of our churches. We lost control of our ideology. We lost control of our theology. In fact, fortunately, in segregation, we did not have the stuff that invades the community as preaching 
from afar. And so what we do is that we, we listen to it and we adopt it and we read the books of the people who have vested interests from the very beginning of slavery to dismantle you with their theology. When Matt Turner rebelled in the state of Virginia in 1831, killing almost 65 white people down in Jerusalem, or Boykin, Virginia, down there, when they met in court, they said the reason he did it is because of the fact that he was instructed wrong by his people. Less than now the question becomes, shall we give these people, these black people, Christianity or not? And they said, okay, we will give it to them because it will be to our advantage to bring them under control and submission. That is what has happened. And it happened again after 1954. When I had all my teachers were basically black. And they would talk to you about what to do and what not to do. And then there came a point where we had no teachers in the classroom. that look like us. And then we have theology which is not appropriate for us. That is what's going on. And I'll just ask you this simple question. Whose advantage is forgiveness? To the perpetrator or to the victim? That is something to think about. Dr. Sanders, you raised the uh, question I was going to move into that, but I think because you raised it with regard to the education, and I want to ask both of you to kind of share, mm -hmm. with regard to black seminary, what should be our curriculum now? Sanders, I mean, said, <clears throat> you know, what he clearly communicated is that <clears throat> because we have a different social political status in America, uh, that we have different, not just different material needs, but we have different theological needs. So, um, I think our curricula. citizens in the body politic. Um, and so uh, I think there should be, um, in, in addition to uh, black theology, and, uh, and I don't want you to get upset, but um, I better not say that. I say enough anyway. Um, but um, there should be black certainly should be black theology um, and, and, and our pastoral theology needs as you know better than I are more I mean are different right um, but we also need that to be able to understand for us to be leaders to understand the forces in community um, that are assailing our people and controlling our lives so um, we must have a fundamental understanding of economics of the economics wow. and, and, and political economy. We must know. We must know the difference. For instance, um, we can't just talk about justice. I mean, there are you know, three major forms of justice.
justice, right? Ethics of civilian, right? Libertarianism, utilitarianism, egalitarianism. Um, you know, um, we have to be able to understand the workings of capitalism. Be able to answer questions like, why is Martin Luther King, why was he so high on um, democratic socialism? We should be. Uh, we should be able to. We should be conversant on that. Um, uh, courses in um, in basic basic um, political science. I mean, this can all be, of course, and often it's often all often you know from ethics, right? In ethics courses, but um, there aren't a lot of courses that 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 really zero in. You know, they're, they're like, yeah, survey courses. I don't know. I feel like if we're going to really be effective leaders, we, we need to be able to, to, to pick up the Congressional Record or the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal and understand exactly what's, what's going on and, and break it down for our people. So I think those are the, those are the kinds of important things we need, not only in, in terms of preaching courses, but our preaching. Our preaching courses should uh, should be heavily um, exegetical, right? So um, when so when we preach, we can preach how radical the Lord's Prayer is yeah, for us. Yeah. You know, the, the, the depth of the Lord's Prayer. I mean, once I years ago, I remember preaching that the radicality of the Lord's Prayer, um, and I was you know much younger and much more brash. And I was preaching um, in Jersey, the community in which I was known and, 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 you know, and, and, and that I knew. Um, and the response from the young people, frankly, almost scared me. They jumped up shouting, we got to do something. We got to do something. I was afraid they would go out and, and riot. And, uh, you know, and it wasn't because I was such a great preacher, because I'm not. I can do all right now. but. Uh, <laughs> But it's, it's the power of the, you know, the power of the, of the exegesis, the exegesis. And so, you know, those are the things. And so in, in a nutshell, I think our curriculum has to be weighted toward, um, uh, toward holistic spirituality, right? Uh, and this, yeah, and this, because I said, said holistic spirituality, and, you know, vertical and horizontal. Um, on the vertical, loving God, I think we have to try to evolve a real tradition of interiority, um, which we really don't have in the Christian church. You know, we, we don't have, I mean, Jesus modeled it in Luke 4 uh, when he went out in the wilderness. He modeled those spiritual ministrations. He modeled um, contemplation, meditation, fasting, solitude. You know, um, uh, we don't really have that. We don't. Have, if there's silence in the um, during the service, you know, the preacher thinking something's wrong. They get scared. No, no. You know, you, you can't hear the still small God, uh, voice of God if we, if we run our mouth. You know, the whole through the whole service. Uh, we need, you know, we need real meditation. You know, real interiority, a real tradition of spiritual interiority. I have to tell you, the deepest spiritual experiences I have, I've had have not been in the church. They've been in, in ashrams. Um, they, uh, they've even been in, 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 in masjids, uh, you know, overseas, uh, because they have time for silence and to try to feel the spirit of God. We don't do that. We are in the shower, we're singing the whole time. Um, uh, and I think also, we try to, we try to inculcate real tradition of study. Um, Jews have it. They study, that's a real important part of their tradition. Muslims have it. We don't have it. We have to come to Bible study for an hour and come to service on Sunday and maybe read a little on the, on the side in the morning, but not real depth and depth study. We don't have it even. So I, that's the kind of, those are the kind of things I think would be important for to empower black 
seminaries to really produce the kind of Christian leaders who can go out and lead our communities in trying to uh, clean up this society and make it more, uh, make it more just and more loving. Thank you so much, my friend. You ain't got to see the nose to just press the press button. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we, we are best friends, so long. And so on, we tease each other all the time. You got this little boy can say Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah, I, I just think that um, I was thinking about our curriculum. I think that was the question. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. <laughs> uh, the curriculum and so on. You know, what should we be you I think you were asking what should we be teaching in our seminary? You know, and so on. Um, I could write a whole seminary curriculum for us, but I don't know whether our faculty will really accept it. <laughs> so, so this 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 we, we, we do this very honestly as a community. We say, what do you teach in Old Testament? What do you teach in New Testament? What do you teach here and there and so on and so on? So, so we have we have this airing of what we teach. Okay. Now this is allegedly an African seminary. I'm gonna put that up there. Allegedly, this is an African seminary. We're talking about diasporic people who left their continent long time ago and came here as slaves and now trying to make a living or trying to survive their own holocaust or their own Babylonian captivity here in America. How do you train people or you teach people to survive this situation? over here. All right? What does that look like in our homiletics department? What does that look like in our biblical department? You know, both Old and New Testament. And this is what I see. The reason why we can have some relationship, see by the way, our people did not accept all the stuff that was handed on to them. That is those who were critical. They did not do that. How, uh, how was Uncle's grandmother in Cana? Where she said, I don't like Paul. Because all the way slavery, they were telling the slaves obey your master, for it's right in the Lord. And as a legend that came from Paul, she may not have been so critical as we live with God about today, about what Paul wrote and what did, Paul did not write and what came through the legacy of Paul into the church. But at least she saw it. And then what, how, 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 what do you read then? If you don't read Paul, then what do you read? Well, we read the prophets. We read the prophets. And we read Jesus as being a prophet. That's the thing that Muslims and Christians, or at least radical Christians, can, can agree on. That we, we understand Jesus as a prophet. He preached the kingdom of God that the kingdom of God was coming, and that those who were in danger of being lost should repent and come back. It's called Sankofa in Ghana. It's called repentance. And what did you do to bring the people back? Now, here's what I see. We need to continue to teach biblical studies, but we need to understand when it comes to the homiletics department, or to other, to, to the seminary, that, or to pastoral life, that in the Gospel of Matthew, of which you take the text, you set step, that there's a whole genealogy before it begins. Yes. And then you come down, 14 generations, and 14 generations, and 14 generations, and then you get to Jesus. And Jesus went out preaching. 
and his demand in the preacher's exercise was much more stringent than anybody has ever heard. You have heard it said, thou shalt not do this, but I say to you, in terms of raising up a community of people. All right? This is what is needed in a Romanized world that he lived in. Wow. Yes. He was calling Matthew out of the tax collector's office, a Roman agent, and said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn to me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you will find rest for your soul. Inviting people out of those structures yeah. in order that they yeah. might be saved. Yeah. This is what I'm going to talk about. Yeah. All right? Now, if you're going to be a pastor, by the way, uh, my, my, oh, this is my, my buddy. He's really my friend. Okay. You know, but he, he, he works in a different context. I work at Virginia Union. I'm talking to black people all the time. Pastor, I've been in Africa for 25 years straight up until COVID. I went to Africa. I was like Nehemiah. I was in the Babylonian exile. This is how I understand myself. I do not understand myself going to Jerusalem at all. Wow. I understand myself going to Africa. It is my Zion. That's where I go to Zion. So does my peace. Get Zion. And I go there to refresh myself and come back here. I did it for 25 years. 51 times in Ghana, Ethiopia, 15 other African countries. I go home. in Africa, and I come here, and now, when I'm selected a pastor of my church, I want to know, just as the priests and priestesses knew the whole lineage of Israel in the Gospel of Matthew, from Abraham down, I want to know, what do you know about that? Yeah. What do you you can't say we were liberated in 1865. What do you know on the other side of the water? That's right. Yeah. That's right. What happened to the people on the other side of the water? Mm -hmm. What happened before the Babylonian captivity? Yeah. Why are you captive? Why are you in Babylon? Well, we have something to say about that. It's because things you have done. One, you have not honored the God of your ancestors. And number two, you have not honored your ancestors either. That's why you need your condition. That is in African theology, traditional African thinking. Like Boy, ass, when they bombed Kenya. See, and listen, another thing you need to do, keep up with world history. Yeah. Keep up with Ukraine. Yeah. Keep up with Russia. Yeah. Keep up with everything in the world yeah. that yeah. you know. And then you can make some wise decisions mm -hmm. about this. All right? And this is what, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Says your God, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that the war is over. She has paid doubly for her sin. Yeah. The voice cries in the wilderness. Yeah. Prepare the way of the Lord. Lord have mercy. This is what we got to do. We got to have a seminary that reflects that. Yes, because when we came out of slavery, that's why we have agricultural and mechanical colleges mm. on the history of our people. Yeah. That's why Booker D. Washington yeah. did what he did. And others did it, and Marcus Garvey, and all of the rest. We don't teach Marcus Garvey anymore. Yeah. We 
don't teach it. But we need to start teaching it because our people are in bad condition based on the continent of Africa as well as here. And we gotta do something about it. You can't just say that you've got some knowledge. And like Obi, my friend has said, if you don't do anything with it, why do you have it? Yes. Why do you come to seminary if that's what you're gonna do? You could have stayed home. Lord, come on, Pastor. Hey. Dr. West has talked about stress. We must ask seriously the question, why are we so stressed out? All of us, not individuals, but collectively as a group of people. Why are we so stressed out? It's because we don't believe in liberation. We believe in patching up. righteousness of God. God came down on Mount Sinai in a violent smoke. It's a crystallizing. It's a cleansing process. And that is what we have to do in terms of our teaching, in terms of Christian education. What should that be in a black seminary? Yeah. Is it books that the white folks have written? Oh, is it something else. What is Christian education? Well, in my Christian education program, if I were a seminary, I would be teaching people how to build houses. I would be teaching plumbing. I would be teaching how to do electrical work. I would be teaching brick masonry and how to build buildings. <laughs> oh, glory! You have a book at T. Washington Seminary. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what I would have. Yeah. Well, you know, you raised a man, man, say that. Yes, that's what I would have to be doing. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, want to hear I'm over the place. Uh, I run out of the place. No, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate it, man. Because yeah. you raised, you supplied some, some stuff. When I was president of Faith Seminary, one of the things we started this to is got to be what one was called. And, and, um, but we talked about um, uh, having courses that prepare people to do practical stuff. Right. Um, and you know, we had courses on rudimentary, more basic finance. Um, Banking finance, stuff like that, you know, um, education theory for you know, folks who want to be able to go out and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and um, work in it to, to influence educational policy and all, all that. So, all those things, all those kinds of things are, 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 are important. But, you know, there should be a track um, that has, that teaches basic construction management. Oh, yeah. Know, basic st skills like that. Since we're going, so we so we can build. Right. So we because we should be looking to build housing right? yeah. and all, all that. Thing. It shouldn't be left to Jimmy uh, Carter and the uh, right. Habitat for Community. Right. You know, home, home. all those things are important. But there's something else I, I'm I like to propose that that might be a bit more iffy, but it's 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 just as important. And that is, I'm thinking about Jewish children. They go to Hebrew school on Saturday morning, mm -hmm. and they learn to read their scripture, mm -hmm. which is Hebrew. Mm -hmm. We have Sunday school. We, we don't teach. I mean, kids learn. They can learn a computer from two, three years old. Mm -hmm. They can learn real quick. But we don't teach them to read the Bible. Mm -hmm. We teach them to read translations of the Bible. Right. When these kids, they can learn to read Koine Greek and, and Biblical Hebrew just as easy as they can learn to, 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 to read English. And, and, and uh, we can raise up, um, <clears throat> you know, many scholars in, in, in the faith. It's not far-fetched. The, the Jews do it, Muslims do it. It, it, it makes, us, makes one wonder sometimes just how serious are we about this, about this faith? Because everybody is educating their, these other major religions are educating right. their people much more deeply, more thoroughly than we're, than we're educating our people. 
Um, and it, it, it's, it can be easily done. We got Sunday school yeah. already. And we can have Saturday morning. The kids, they learn like that. And they can come back and teach us. I just, I just want to interject that as, as, as something uh, you know, for thought for, for the church. Thank you so much. Can we give both Dr. Hendricks and Dr. Sanders a hand? And we have time for just one burning question from you. Is there someone who has one burning question before we turn this back over to our dean? Anyone will? Yes. Dr. Kim. I don't know that one, one question is fair. Just one. I know. Thank you so much, Dr. Henderson. And I feel like I have to say something because I see some of my students who just finished taking my course on the New Testament. And I'd like to go back to the, the gospel discussion. And I want to put this conversation about the gospel into the larger context of the first century where Jesus and Paul proclaimed the gospel. So for me, the gospel is not the knowledge of a set of doctrine, but the gospel, you know, the word coming from the Evangelion from a uh, Greek word, which means good news. So I just want to make a, a quick comment, and all I'm asking you, if you can, you know, ask my question, that is about the definition of the gospel. What is Evangelion and good news? As New Testament scholar, I'm interested in knowing what the nature or definition of the good news that Jesus proclaimed. By the way, in Mark 1, 14, after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus began to proclaim what? Of the good news of God. He did not proclaim about himself. He pointed to, to God, and then the good news of God is about the rule of God. In other words, in Matthew and Luke, you know, Jesus proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God. In other words, the good news of God had to do with the fact that God rules the world with love and justice, you know, radical love of the marginalized and weak people, all the foolish people, right? So Jesus did not proclaim about himself. The good news is not knowledge. Jesus proclaimed that God take care of the marginalized, all the people who are not taken care of by Rome and society and elite. Right? So they write a message of the good news of God, which is about the rule of God. And also Paul, you know, for me, you know, his apostleship is set apart for the good news of God. That's where he says, you know, he senses his apostleship as what? The apostle set apart for the gospel of God. So both for Paul and Jesus begins with the God when they talk about the good news. So, right. yeah, let me finish this and, you know. So the definition of the gospel in Paul, you know, he says the gospel is the, uh, the power of God for salvation. You know, the gospel is God's saving power. So a lot of people need different kinds of good news in the world, right? So God's saving power has to do with all kinds of a transformative, you know, liberative work that can help the real people. So I'm just asking, and so for me, Christianity must reclaim the goodness of God, which was exemplified and proclaimed by Jesus. And who are Christians then? We have to proclaim the gospel of God that was proclaimed by Jesus. So your, so your question is the definition of the gospel. Well, yes. That, I mean, Thank that, you. I mean, you, you're right. But good news is, I guess, if the prior question is, what is the bad news that the good news was to was to address? Um, and uh, what uh, Jesus uh, talked about uh, the good news. Uh, the good news was in uh, just position to the bad news. What was the bad news that <coughs> the primary bad news of this setting in light? Um, it was the extreme uh, 
poverty of the people. It was a, a, the brutal uh, oppression of the people by the Roman Empire and by their own priestly aristocracy. It was the uh, uh, the psychic and ideological domination by the priestly aristocracy, um, such that the, uh, the woman with the, uh, the widow's might, such that uh, she would give all that she had, um, didn't even have anything left to eat with, because she is so enthralled with the power of the priestly aristocracy. That's, those are some of the elements that, of, the, of the bad news that uh, the good news was to, was to speak to. And was, uh, I mean, and I'm just speaking on material terms. Of course, as 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 you uh, and you rightly implied, Dr. Kim, the good news is to speak to the bad news on all kinds of levels. You know, um, and so Jesus says, uh, "Blessed are you, poor folks." Um, you don't have to tell people they're blessed if they, if they already know they're blessed, unless they don't know they're blessed, unless they're, they're feeling crushed and dehumanized. So he's speaking in all those ways. Um, and when he speaks about salvation and, 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 and deliverance, as, 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 as we know, those concepts come from the time of uh, the Exodus and, and through the Hebrew Bible. And we know that throughout the Hebrew Bible until the very end, probably until the Maccabean period, into the Testament period, um, Hebrew, um, the, the, um, the Hebrews become the Israelites, the Jews. Um, they had no conception of an afterlife. You know, you just go into, you die and you go down and that's it. Um, and so when we talked about, from Moses on, deliverance and salvation, it wasn't deliverance into, in, into another realm. It was deliverance on this earth. From And, and what's the deliverance from? It's from... Um, it was from the, the terrible um, horror and oppression they was exp and exploitation they were experiencing on this earth. Now, of course, salvation, <clears throat> you know, one can be, you know, psychically and, and mentally, uh, you know, uh, enslaved as well, and, and uh, spiritually enslaved, need deliverance in that way as well. But the foundational concept is, um, has to do with on the ground stuff. So what I'm suggesting is that Jesus was a very grounded, I mean, he was a Messiah before he was called the Son of God. And the Messiah, the Messiah's responsibility were to, to, to protect the people and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and to be a herald of deliverance from the ills and the oppressions of this, of this world. So that's why, so that's what good news uh, good news means to me. It means primarily Jesus was talking about the things that uh, he was referring to the things that he talked about most. And what he talked about most was what the people's suffering was on this in this world. He didn't talk about the other world. Um, uh, uh, that was not his primary his primary discourse. That's that's what good news means to me. In terms of Paul, Paul has another way of looking at things. Paul's not concerned, as we know, as concerned about the oppression in the world because he's expecting the world to end. He's, you know, so they're not, Paul and Jesus are not necessarily saying the same thing. Let's let me say Jesus was talking about the kingdom, the sole sovereignty of God. What is the Malkut Shemayim, the sole sovereignty of God? It goes back to Gideon. And only God has the right to dominate. Um, and, uh, um, and being in being control of the world, well, then who who decides uh, who, who who is going to dominate? Well, that's why we have the, the basic biblical ethics. They mediate. They decide. You know, we're, all we're supposed to do is to try to apply them as best as best that we as best we can. So the kingdom of God also then is is about. Um, is about the kingdom of justice in this world. That's what the concept comes from. Paul makes the kingdom of, of God an, an ethical state, something different that accords with this disembodied understanding of, of, of Jesus that, you know, the only Jesus he, that, that, that he encountered. And he never studied with Jesus, and he, he didn't study with, and he was proud to say, I didn't study with the disciples either. And in fact, when he met the disciples, he told them they were wrong, that they had Jesus wrong. And he 
Connolly wrote about that in, 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 in his, his letters, right? So that's that's what just good news means you know, to me in my understanding. Okay, for me, I think there are little bits and pieces in Paul that are very useful for oppressed people still. Mm. And then Jesus, of course, because he was under Roman dominated, uh, in a Roman dominated society. So he was speaking to real context, real situations, real problems. And he spoke also to his own people about their real problems. This is the same person who also said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You see, killing the prophets and those who are said to you. If I had just, if you had just listened, I would have gathered you. So he spoke to the Roman in his life, and he spoke to his own people. This is what I find in Paul. You know, I, I, I teach him, I've written on him, and so forth. And this is what the gospel means for me, Dr. Kim, in Paul. What is this good news, you ask? The good news is that we stop going to Roman courts to settle out the issues. Because you cannot get justice in a Roman court. He says, isn't there someone wise enough among you to settle your issues? Because death means death to Roman ways. The cross crucifies the receiver of the believer. That is in the wrong world, because he preached among Gentiles for the most part. Preached to Jews too, but they did not accept generally the message. But to us, by the way, those of you should not flaunt your strength against weak people. Why don't you wait until all the people come to eat? rather than going on and splurging yourself. Or this. Take this one. It is a crazy person. And that's not in this language. Well, you can see when you say crazy. No, 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 no. <laughs> but listen, it is a crazy person who compares himself to another. Anyone who compares himself to another is without sense. That's the end of 2nd Corinthians letter. That means you are, you are, listen, to people who oppress, if they just could hear that, what a world of difference it would be. Because you wouldn't be running behind other people. Thinking that they have the way, and you don't have it. All Galatians, Here's another one. This is the good news. He says that I preached the gospel among you. Now somebody want to add to it. That's basically the context, correct? In the Galatians letter. Somebody is trying to add some other stuff. Circumcision is necessary. He says, what does that mean for black folks? You don't have to be white to be accepted in the sight of God. Just that simple. Be yourself black. Say it loud, James Brown, I'm black and proud. And you don't have to take on the culture of other people to be respected and loved by God. Nor do whites have to do that either. That's the benefit. You don't have to do it on either side. Be your black self. That is what I get out of that. That's why I, I, I still have to teach in the Testament studies. I still have to teach the Apostle Paul, and I still have to teach Jesus, and I still have to teach the historical Jesus, and then I have to go over into these, what we used to call Catholic letters, and talk about that too. I got to talk about what is real religion from the book of James. What is it? That's for an oppressed group of people. Remember that these people were people without mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers 
because they decided to make Jesus their choice. And when you are made Jesus your choice, you are put out. If you really make that your yeah. choice, yeah. you are put out. Now the question is, what do the put out people do? Well, in America, we were black slaves. Put out.
every month we will have a virtual worship experience and one of our faculty members will preach this virtual worship experience. He will record it and, and every faculty member who is competent and called to preach will preach. Everyone, all of them. It will be for faculty to preach and then once we rotate it through, then we'll just keep rotating faculty. Because I think that you as students need to see that they are good preachers as well. And, um, and so this month, um, out of celebration of Women's Month, which I'm always awkward about these month celebrations and stuff, but, um, but uh, Dr. Naomi Franklin has agreed to be our preacher. And so, um, and my goal is for students to see the amazing gifts, anointing, and grace on our faculty. So uh, be, be on the lookout for that. So we're going to take five minutes. 12 of five, we'll come back. Uh, Kareem's going to come in. And, and Kareem, we'll just do the kind of general question and answer for students. And then we'll try to get you guys out of here. Um, thank all of you who've come from wherever you come from. Thank you for being here. Remember, August 4th and 5th. And, and I'm, I'm making no apologies, and I need the faculty to back me up on this. I make no apologies. Community formation will be mandatory. You can't be in this school and never come to campus until graduation. <laughs> you know, that's, no, we're not doing that. So, you know, we have to create a culture of accountability, and uh, we will incentivize, but we will more importantly make sure that everybody is comfortable and confident in the fact that we are a community. So we're gonna take five minutes, and then, and then Kareem will come. Um, and, and listen, before we go any further, can we, uh, some of our staff has run into some, you know, uh, Sister Yvette had to 